Alrighty, folks. So, we're going to start uh, talking a lot about what the word uh, eco means. As with a lot of the other sciences, well, every science, um, there's a lot of prefixes and suffixes. They're not really explained to you that way, presented to you that way. But when you see the same word or part of the same word show up over and over and over again, I'd like to think that you start to say, hey, you know, I think that must mean something. It starts every word, you know, every important word in this chapter starts with the same four letters. wonder what that's all about. My favorite example in uh, geology is the, uh, the word size, not S-I-Z-E as you guys spell it, but S-E-I-S. -E and um, the word is, is uh, that you'd probably be most familiar with is seismograph. Seismograph is that uh, pen and weird piece of scrolling paper that you always see in movies when there's an earthquake and little pen bounces up and down on that piece of paper. So we've got a seismograph. It makes a seismogram, um, which is read by a seismologist. Uh, and what they're all studying are seismic waves. So you see that size over and over and over again. It's there because it, it means something. Well, eco is the same thing. Whether it's ecosystem, ecology, maybe even economy. I don't know. I'll have to look into that one. I think but, <laughs> but, um, but you see this word over and over again. Um, ology is another one. Heck, you guys are probably taking three ologies this semester, if not this year. O L O G Y comes from logos, all right, and it, it's it means information. So ology is the study of. So whether it's psychology, biology, whatever, they mean stuff. And that was kind of cool. It was like the last time words actually meant anything. Um, they were talking, you know, a lot with the Latin, and to some extent the Greek. Um, I call it Latin English myself. Latin English, Latin -glish, yes. Yes, sir. All right. So, um, at any rate, so I try to point this stuff out as we go through because you know there's some carryover into into the rest of the world. So, anywho, ecosystems and energy, chapter three. Please read the chapter. <coughs> so, ecology is the study of interactions between organisms. Or, more correctly, or a bigger picture, however you want to say it, um, the study of interactions between organisms and their environment. And the, one of the biggest things we've got to kick in with you guys right off the bat is that we also mean plants, not just critters, when we talk about organisms. All right? Plants and animals. We got the two things. Um, and together, uh, plus a little bit more, bless you, we call that the environment. And again, we'll, we'll get into all of this, but um, just like I said, it's just part of talking right now. So the interactions between the organisms and um, the area that they live in, which we'll roughly define environment as for right now. So Ernst Haeckel um, defined the word uh, ecology, or not defined, came up with the word ecology uh, a while ago. And it comes from two words, uh, eco, which is Greek for house, and logi, which is Greek for study, which is more or less what I just told you. I didn't tell you um, house yet, but... So Ernst Haeckel was a uh, scientist. He did a lot of cool stuff. What I actually knew him for um, were his uh, drawings. He was, um, if you've ever seen, eh, there's not a whole lot of places they are in the world if you're not in that realm, but like at a museum, um, some real sciencey looking old um, pictures of spores or leaves or seashells. Um, he was a very early illustrator of um, for, for science. That's how I knew him. 
Um, he had, uh, as, as many folks did back in the day, when you were a naturalist, you did a whole lot of things. But he was a natural scientist, just simply put. But I, I knew him for his, for his uh, drawings. And they may have actually been wood cuttings, not even drawings. But because uh, that was an easy way to make, you know, repetitious prints at that point. So he coined the phrase ecology back in the 1800s. Study of our house, the study of the earth. Okay, again, some words you know, but we have a different context for them now. All right, you know what a population is, you know certainly what a community is. But what a community might mean to you and your neighbors, wherever you happen to live, um, we're going to tweak that just a, a little bit. Nothing horribly weird, but it, it means I'd like to think a little bit more um, than, than you may have thought in the past. <clears throat> so very specifically, a population is a group of organisms living in the same environment, but the catch is they all have to be the same species. So you would talk about a population of not even just squirrels, but a population of red squirrels or a population of gray squirrels. And if you didn't know that such things existed, and you just thought that that squirrel was a redhead, and that squirrel was a blonde, and, and so on and so forth, no, they're actually different species, all right? Um, so that's what a, a population is. And again, it could be uh, oak trees, maple trees, a sugar maple, though. But more again, I'm much more of a critter guy than I am a plant guy. Not a fan of botany, but, uh, you know, it's there. we got to deal with it. So I'm just going to say oak trees because I don't know species of oak. I do happen to know a few maples. So we'll say a sugar maple. All the sugar maples uh, in an area would be the population. So, again, I'm not going to call you on I'm not going to yell at you. But if you just say squirrel or oak tree, well, you're really not specific enough for what a population means. What's that? Uh, maybe. They certainly could live in them. Certainly could live in them. Um, community, all right, is all the different populations that live together. So again, you could think of your community, okay, um, and all the different populations. Now, of course, we are all the same species, so when you talk about a community, you might bring nationality into it, okay? Um, sorry? Yes, yes. Like, uh, again, I grew up back in the 80s, and, and um, we weren't as exactly PC back then, and we didn't necessarily say these things in the, in the derogatory way, but, you know, oh, well, there's, the, there's that Irish family down the street, or you Italians over here, and uh, I was one of the Italians, or the Slovaks were over there, and, and so on and so forth. So we were all these different populations. We are all the same species, though, of course, right? We use, so you use it slightly differently, is my point. So, um, anywho, so a community is uh, all the same, uh, all, all of the populations that live together, okay, in the same environment. And we're going to explain, of course, what an environment is at some point. Okay, another vocabulary. It's a lot of vocabulary in this chapter, guys. Be wary. A lot of vocabulary. Ecosystem. And some of you, there'll be more vocabulary than others because there's a word right here, biotic, that you might not know. All the biotic interactions of a community, as well as the interactions between organisms and their, in other words, abiotic environment. So, an ecosystem is all the biotic interactions of a community, as well as the interactions between organisms, the bios, and they're abiotic, a means not, non-organism environment. So the rocks, the dirt, the water, all of that non-alive stuff out there. Notice I didn't say the grass, the trees, because again, those are organisms. The weather could even be considered an abionic component of an environment. So bio, 
biotic. It comes from bios. Okay, biology. This is a biology class. Bios is life. A means not. Atypical. Anomaly. <coughs> Abnormal. Handful of times we use that prefix A. Typically it means more or less no or not. And I think we covered that one already. No, prefix is for, er, first. Pre in front. Suffix is N. Yeah. Uh, logos. Ology would be an example of a suffix. Yeah, so prefix comes in the beginning of a word, suffix comes at the end of the word. Um, bum, 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 bum. So, an ecosystem, then, is its community plus its physical environment. All right, so we're tweaking that word abiotic just to mean something you could maybe picture a little easier. All right, uh, a physical environment. Sorry, my throat was rough this morning, and then I talked for a little over an hour. It's getting even rougher now. So here's those words again. Um, if you didn't write down what I said a moment ago, you're seeing it again, luckily. We are going to, I use, so we are going to, use the words environment and ecosystem as if they mean the same thing. They are, they're, they are similar. They are similar. There's the key. Similar. All right. Um, I use them interchangeably, and I can't stop at this point. Still time for you guys. There are subtle differences. Okay. How incredibly important they are is another question. But... So, I may say environment when we've just been talking about ecosystem. I apologize. I may say ecosystem when we've been talking about environment. They mean essentially the same thing. Both of them have both biotic and abiotic components. Again, biotic is all the living organisms, be they plant or animal. And yes, there's other things out there. There's fungi and bacteria. You may be thinking there's one other thing we could throw in there, right? Um, if you're not sick from a bacteria, you're sick from what? A virus, yeah. The difference is, and why they're not living here, is that viruses aren't living. That's why they can't really do anything for you when you go to the doctor with a virus. They can't kill it. Not alive. It's basically an errant piece of code, okay, that floats around. It's, it's a parasite, um, but it's not alive. Parasites are alive, sorry, bad example, but you get the idea. All right, so that's why they can't kill viruses. <clears throat> We're working on antivirals, but they basically just assemble stuff or confuse it to make it so it can't attach or it can't replicate, but you, you can't kill them. So viruses aren't alive, but plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, that pretty much covers the kingdoms you learn, right? Yeah. You know, so uh, we got protists in there, but protists are covered under these guys. And then the abiotic. All right, abiotic is the non-living, as we mentioned. Um, oh, I threw space and sunlight in. I, I, I forgot those in the uh, conversation a couple minutes ago. Um, the atmosphere would be much better than saying space, I suppose. Uh, the sunlight. You mean all the space? Well, it does play a part on our life. Uh, radiation from space and so on and so forth. But yeah, as I just said, um, atmosphere would probably be a better substitute right now. Uh, the sunlight, the weather, the rocks, etc. The atmosphere going out of space. Yes, sir. All right, and etc. So the ecosystem contains all of that, and how all of that interacts is our concern. So here is an ecosystem, and you know, you've got the stuff that you've come to know and love. You've got not just the water and the ground, You've got the plants growing in that ground. You've got the critters uh, crawling in and around and through that ground, swimming in the water. And I would say most of that is, is the biotic, but there's a few. The water itself, again, is abiotic. Um, yeah, and the, and the ground is abiotic, yeah. Um, but we're adding, and this is a lot of the stuff that you might not have thought of, the salinity of the water is important. And we get to the point of, of talking about um, the different kinds of environments, which we will. 
you'll find out that some critters and or some plants um, only live in fresh water. You probably knew this already, but we'll give you the vocabulary for it. Some only live in extremely salty water. Some live in this mediocre mix that we call brackish water that's watered down salt water, if you would. <coughs> Go ahead. So would flame scours would be considered uh, um, uh, a prebiotic? Why? Because technically the lemon part of that is using the sour as sort of the toxin. Yeah, that's true. So because it it serves as a house for them, so to speak. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question, and I might have to ponder that one over a beer one of these days. Um, and the thing is, is that they they grow that shell, right? Uh -huh. So they grow that shell by by secreting uh, calcium carbonate or calcite. They get that calcite. In an or inorganic manner, they they pull it out of the water. Oh. All right, um, but they create it so it's organic-ish. Um, <coughs> that's like I said that one, that well that one's riding the fence. But no, straightforward because it's a house. Is it a, is it abiotic or no? It's not. Uh, and in my mind, I'm probably don't watch videos during class, please. At least if you're gonna sit in the front row. No. Don't watch videos in class. At least you can sit in the front row. You want to watch videos, go to the back row. Those poor people don't need the right thing. So, um, anywho. So that's a great question. All right? And, and I don't have a definite answer. Like I said, I might be reading too much into it, too. Because I'm confusing inorganic and organic. I'm not confusing, but meddling. <coughs> what else? Well, the atmosphere. All right? And not just the atmosphere, but it's the gases that we see in the atmosphere are cycling through. And you guys are going to get a bit of this later. All right, where we're going to talk about various cycles, the nitrogen cycle and, and, and the carbon cycle and, and all these things. Um, precipitation, that's part of the weather. That has a huge effect, uh, mainly in how much water an area is going to have, okay, or not have. In an area like this, you know, you're going to hope that they've got a decent amount of water. There obviously this is an aquatic or a semi aquatic at any rate ecosystem. The sunlight, all right, and so on and so forth. So it's not just the stuff that you see right off the bat. You stop and ask yourself, okay, what is, the, you know, the support structure would be a good way to put it. What's keeping all this working? And um, that then you start to fully bring in the, the ecosystem. What's thunder? Sorry? Thunder. I'm going to guess it's that type of bird. Oh, uh, you drive yourself with Yes, sir. Yes, it does. All right, so leave it to scientists to like totally kill all the fun out of everything. Um, so that cool little picture we just showed you with all the nice little birdies and, and crabs and bunnies and foxes and grasses and all that stuff and seashells. Well, they're going to bring it all down to the most basic level of it's all energy. And it's all energy just cycling through. And, and it is. <coughs> but that's what we have to talk about for a little while. So energy, as you probably know, you've heard this definition since you've been hearing definitions about energy. The capacity or the ability to do work. And the best way to think about that is a battery or a Twinkie or a carrot stick. Okay, you don't often think of food as energy. Some of you do. All right, but it is essentially those are little people batteries. Okay? And um, so that's what we think of, of energy as. You also, what you don't think of energy as is um, <clears throat> position sometimes. The fact that those erasers are up in the air, if I happen to bump them, all right, they would fall to the ground. They have some inherent built-in energy based on, you know, where they actually are. Um, energy is a whole lot of things, but it's also for once the stuff you thought about. Also, oftentimes we do abbreviate it as the capital E, all right? Uh, let's we'll throw up an equation or two, um, or even sometimes I'm just trying to save a couple letters typed. I'll just put in a capital E, and you'll see this in a lot of places. So energy is, is capital E. Um, so it's expressed as units of work or heat, uh, kilojoules, uh, kilocalories, all right? Usually with uh, people, organisms, we talk about calories. <clears throat> You're trying to power a city. Uh, they're thinking about joules, 
but you can actually, uh, as you see right here, um, you actually can convert back and forth uh, kilocalorie is equal to so many kilojoules, and I'm never going to ask you that because please don't waste any of your brain power remembering it. But if you dig that kind of stuff, feel free. So one kilocalorie is the energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius, which happens to be 4.184 kilojoules. That's the part I'm never going to ask you for. Are you going to see that definition? <coughs> Quite possibly. But it'll be multiple choice, don't worry. And I'm certainly never going to ask you the numbers. All right? There will be a few numbers here and there that we have to remember, and I'll be sure to let you know when and what those are. But this definition, yeah, it's kind of important. So energy is the capacity or ability to do work. That is one question. Hopefully it's you know, an easy question for you. Um, but then as a good, great follow-up question, we define energy by these this, this last bullet here. Energy is a lot of stuff. I just gave you a handful, and I forgot to mention a couple really, really obvious ones. Okay. Um, so chemical energy, that was most of the ex examples I gave you, be it a battery, okay, or that carrot stick. That's chemical energy. It's stored, by the way, because you're going to hear about two other types of energy. You guys remember kinetic energy and potential energy? Remember those words? All right. So these are all types of that, even. Radiant energy. Not just your radiator. If you're happy enough to have, or lucky enough to have an old house with radiators in it instead of uh, forced air, all right, you're familiar with uh, radiant heat. The sun gives us radiant energy, and it's sunlight. And packed in that, there's, oh goodness, there's all kinds of different wavelengths. Not just heat. There's light, visible energy. There's sound. Well, the sun doesn't give sound, but sound is another type of energy. X-rays, you've heard of those. Okay. So energy comes in a lot of different ways and means. Yes, sir? I asked this question to my dad, and he tried to think of answers, but we have a problem. Is there any tangible type of energy that burns through that much? What do you mean by tangible? As like energy you can practically hold. I think I kind of understand what he means. Yeah. Uh, well, you want to answer his question? Oh, yeah, like food. That's kind of tangible. Food is a good one. Um, Firewood's another great example. I use I use firewood um, because it actually shows um, how we transfer through that, and I'm sure it's coming up eventually. I might as well explain it now. The really cool thing about wood. All right, so right now it's it's your firewood. You're having gonna have a bonfire, right? But what was it before? It was a tree, presumably, right? All right. So what was that tree? Well, let's go back and let's look that tree. Let's take it back through its time. That tree was, we'll say at some point, it was a seed. So that seed has a lot of potential in it to do whatever it's going to do. But that seed needs energy to grow. It needs water. It needs food. It needs sunlight. So there's, well, water, I guess we could call that energy. But there's at least two sources of energy coming in right there. So we've transferred energy from the sun. We've transferred energy from nutrients into this seed. The seed then has used energy to grow into a tree. It does its happy little tree life, growing leaves and not leaves, and, and some people eat it. Not people, but some organisms eat it. Some live in it. It's arguably uh, giving off and using up energy throughout its life. So then comes along, somebody harvests it, chops it up into firewood, so on and so forth. You come along, you buy a bundle of that firewood at the dairy mart, and you bring it home, and you build a fire. Now, what are we doing to that energy that's been stored in there? You're turning it into light, turning it into heat. Does it make noise? Turning it into sound. What happens to that energy? Well, there is that. Plenty of it does fritter off into space, okay? But a lot of it you're absorbing. You're absorbing the light rays into your eyes. They're going into your brain. It does kind of die with you then. Um, it's about the same as frittering off into space, but that heat might help fuel your metabolism, might keep your metabolism going. 
which arguably moves on to other energies and so on and so forth. So it it, it really yeah, there's there's plenty of tangible um, types of energy. Um, sunlight, I would even argue, you know, you could definitely see it. It might not be something you could feel or hold. Well, you could feel it. You can't hold it though. So yeah, I think I think you guys were just being too strict. Any other questions about, about energy while we're here? I mean, we're going to see a few more slides, but, okay. So we talked about visible energy, light. All right, that is just a wee small part of um, the, what they call the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? Uh, energy, waves. And here's the weird thing about waves. If you think too much about it, uh, wavelengths and energy. That chair is is energy, is wavelengths. You are energy and wavelengths. And and this is where they start having those really weird conversations about, you know, the only fact, your reason you're not falling through your chair is because those wavelengths are clashing and, and so on and so forth. And I, I think they're, you know, a lot of those people are kind of just stoned or something. I'm not sure what's going on there, but there's some truth to it, right? You know, because they're publishing papers and, and, and whatnot. But well, let's move into something way less heady, if you would. Um, X-rays, you know, we, we, we use those. We harness that energy. UV, well, most of the time we spend ourselves, we, we <coughs> find ourselves trying to shield from UV, but um, we use it to clean. Anybody buy one of those phone sanitizers? They, they came out during COVID, right? UV rays kill germs. That's why we try to get them out of the sun, they, they do, their, you know, there's energy in there. Uh, you got your visible light spectrum, Roy G. Biv, right? Remember Roy G. Biv? Think about Roy G. Biv is it's backwards. Um, usually we look at things as increasing, right? <coughs> so the spectrum moves from uh, left to right, gamma rays are the smallest, uh, all the way over to like TV and radio waves, which are really, really big. Um, so we, we, we're used to thinking about stuff from big getting to, to small. Um, Roy G. Biv actually goes backwards, as you see. Um, but the, the problem is is that no one would have remembered like, what would it be like Vibrior. That doesn't sound like anything. So they don't teach you that as a third grader. Uh, Roy G. Biv sounds like somebody's name. You'll remember that. So, But yeah, that's actually backwards wavelength-wise. Uh, just above that, we've got uh, infrared. You've heard of infrared radiation. They used to use it to keep cheeseburgers warm at McDonald's before this whole everything is fresh kick that we've been on since the 90s-ish. You guys wouldn't remember that. But, um, you know, heaters under the, the burgers under the heat lamp. That was when fast food was truly fast, right? Now, talking about prefixes like we did a couple minutes ago. Ultra and infra. All right. Infrared comes after the color red. You notice that ultraviolet comes before the color violet. There's, there's those words mean something. Anywho, microwaves, radar waves, TV, radio, so on and so forth. Those are all different wavelengths. And again, we kind of skipped over gamma rays. But um, so there's all this energy coming out of there uh, from space. He talked about earlier why I listed space. Well. All of this stuff is beaming at us, okay? Some of it gets filtered out by our environment, not all of it. <clears throat> but most of it is emitted from the sun and all the other stars out there. And then we create our own, of course, um, TV waves, radio waves. But other objects, not just humans, e emit uh, at those, those frequencies. One of the biggest things that I, I used to hear about growing up as a kid, I paid a little bit of attention to science back then, was radio telescope. You know, and I'm like, what, do they got a, they got a radio on their telescope? Good for them. You know, that's neat. They can listen to stuff. No, they're looking at radio waves. So then you think, well, wait a minute. Is there broadcasting radio on another planet? I don't know what's going. Well, no, that's just, it's just a, it's just a length of a wave. Okay. Now we're not going to have you guys worry about wavelengths right now. Uh, there may come a point in time when we talk about, you know, I want you to remember the visible spectrum. Okay. Uh, 0.4 to 0.7. But, micrometers, right? You've seen that in lab already. So, um, but right now, please don't, you know, worry about that. What I do want you to remember, though, as we already mentioned, is that over here on the left, very, very short. On the right, very, very long. And with energy, 
the shorter, generally speaking, the worser for us, okay, for critters, for life. So you don't want to get hit with gamma rays. You want to spew x-rays. That's why those people run and hide behind those walls. They do it every day for their job. Figure you do a job 25, 30 years, all right? An x-ray here or there isn't going to hurt you. But doing it all day, every day. So that's why they run behind that wall. UV, again, not horribly harmful or we would have never evolved, all right? But it is there. It does have some effect so on and so forth. So, anywho. And that's called the electromagnetic spectrum. They call it that <clears throat> because uh, obviously it has some of these electrical properties that we talk about, but they also figured out over the years that there's some, some magnetism uh, going in on there as well. And the yeah, light isn't magnetic per se. That's another conversation. But All right, so we're back to energy. And remember we talked about radiant versus heat versus visible, all those things. And I indicated that they go under another umbrella. And that umbrella is, is these two, PE and KE, which again, you did learn about at some point in one of your science classes, all right? Uh, potential energy is often thought of the ability to do work. That is you know, almost part of that definition. You have that stored potential. That's your battery. That's your carrot stick. That's the gravity thing. Kinetic energy is the actual movement. It's you moving. It's you putting that battery in your toy robot, and the robot moves and makes noises and so on and so forth. You put the carrot into your digestive system. It gives you energy to go and do things. So you transfer kinetic, kinetic potential to kinetic, okay, uh, quite frequently. Uh, and oftentimes we use kinetic to make potential. And that's when you have to start weighing out, uh, you know, is it worthwhile to do this and worthwhile to do that? Uh, my, all my buddies on Facebook who are against uh, all these newfangled uh, liberal ideas like um, uh, electric cars and, and windmills and all that stuff, they love to point out um, the, uh, the effects on the planet of going and mining all these lithium batteries, right? And yeah, mining's, mining's a horrible thing. Um, to, it can be a horrible thing if done incorrectly. But it is a necessary evil. I'm not that crunchy nutty, okay? I realize um, we didn't have a problem with it. Nobody complained when we were doing it for coal and for oil. We, we are nowadays, of course. So they don't realize the irony in here that they're actually, you know, sort of arguing against the same thing that they're in favor of, but whatever, we won't go there. Um, but there is a cost. And is it worth it? And so on and so forth. The wind farms, the solar farms that are popping up. Okay, Apple's quite proud of the fact that they just made their first... Uh, I think it's one of the watches that is a carbon, completely carbon neutral. All right. They um, offset all of the energy used to produce that product in other ways and, and means. And, and, and God bless them. That's awesome. More power to them. Okay. And in order to do that, they've got um, solar panels. You know, half of Idaho, let's just say, is full of solar panels. All right. Well, what did we cost, expenditure, not just money, but resources to, to make those solar panels and so on and so forth. And I'm not arguing against them. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying it's somebody's got to balance that out. Somebody's got to think about that. Now they'll tell you it's one of those long-term things. Eventually, I got a buddy who bought solar panels for his roof, okay? And they're expensive as hell. I don't know if you, you guys aren't in a position to buy houses yet, let alone decide whether or not to get off the grid or whatever. But they aren't cheap. And he's had them. I knew him probably 20 years. I don't see him so much anymore. I like those solar panels paying off for you yet? Well, not quite. Okay. But they will, eventually. All right? And he's doing a good thing. I get it. And, and the neat thing about those, don't tease one of your neighbors if they have them, because they, they feed it back into the, into the grid. If they don't use it, any extra goes back into the grid. Um, or you could buy batteries and save some of the juice, but... Usually, you're just looking for that bill credit. So you gotta 
you got to keep in mind these ways and these, these means. But it's all about transferring energy from one kind to another. All right? Always. And the last fact here. The last fact here. And this is one of the most important ones. There's always energy loss in every conversion. Going back to our example about the tree turning into logs. Okay? But that's everywhere. That is one of the arguments against gasoline engines. I don't know the numbers. I might have a slide about it in here later. Uh, does anyone know how efficient uh, gas in a motor is? It's it's scary not efficient. No? Nobody? All right. It, it's like 38%. Well, how would you know that already? Well, have you ever felt the hood of a car? Hot. Really hot. Okay. A lot is given off as heat. But it works. It's worked for over 100 years now. It does just fine. Can we find something more efficient? Are they working on making it more efficient? Yeah, you've heard of miles per gallon and so on and so forth. We're working on it. And then that's when you get into the conspiracy theories, right? Well, we can make a car way more efficient, but then the oil companies would be grumpy at us and they'd pay half our advertising budget and blah, 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 blah. You know, who knows what we could really truly do? And who's best interested? And that goes back to the nature of science and politics. Rearing, rearing its ugly head. Politics rules the world, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. My favorite. I actually literally just uttered this word uh, sentence for, for I don't know why. Well, I know why, but I just felt like a, a fool. I was telling someone that thermodynamics is one of my favorite laws. <laughs> it is, but that's a really dorky thing to say. Um, Thermodynamics rules the world. Politics be damned. Um, thermodynamics is in charge. So thermo, heat, okay? And dyna is, is motion and change, all right? So the way that heat changes. Someone is dynamic. They're not very boring, and they're not going to stand there and go, blah, blah, blah. a dynamic person is someone who's out there bouncing around, talking loud, soft, and, and changing all the time. So heat's in changing. So we got two laws of thermodynamics, and they're both really, really great. The first one you've heard a lot of times <coughs> in a couple different ways. Um, we're going to say, because of the chapter we're in, that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Okay. Now, depending on what class you heard this in, you may have heard that matter cannot be created nor destroyed. Uh, sometimes they say mass cannot be created or destroyed. And, and the idea is that energy, mass, and matter are all the same thing, okay? Um, we've known that, or we've felt that for a very long time now. They're all just different forms of the same thing. So you can neither create nor destroy matter, and this is where I usually give my tree conversation, okay? You are, for all intents and purposes, that log is now ashes, okay? It is no longer a log, it was no longer a tree. Did you destroy its energy? Well, it's no longer a tree, but it turned into, what did we mention? It turned into heat. It turned into light. It turned into sound. And yes, as we said at the bottom of that last side, it's not 100% efficient. You didn't absorb all of those things. Some was just lost to the universe, furthering off with my fingers motion. All right. Again, it's a transfer. And that's the first law of thermodynamics. But what's cool about that, what's kind of mind-blowing about that, what's kind of special about that, is what it means is that we have all the energy that we ever have had and all the energy that we ever will have. You're not going to get anything new. And more so, and I'm not necessarily, I'm not talking about reincarnation or anything like that, but what we had since moment one of day one is still here. It's just changed. Um, we, we don't get to talk about cosmology in this class. Cosmology is the study of the universe and, and how everything comes together. All right. But that is where everything, energy and matter that we have uh, came from. One of my favorite phrases from the 70s, we're all stardust, baby. All right, is is true. That is where the elements uh, are fused. Stars are 
elemental fusion engines. It's what they make. The Earth, the other planets, are made of elements. Our atmosphere is elements. You and I are elements. So if you can neither create nor destroy matter, it's all still there. Question. I I kind of disagree with it because technically we get more energy from the sunlight and recently we've been getting um, more because the, the stuff that hits the earth is bouncing back off the atmosphere and back to the earth. So that's why we need global warming. So does that mean we're gaining energy too? Well, I'm talking the total sum. Where it's spread out to, how it's distributed, that can change over time, certainly. Um, <coughs> but the net sum is still, should be constant. Again, keeping in mind the, the always a little bit frittered off. And even that is accounted for somewhere. Um, and that goes into the second law here in a moment, um, which is chaos. All right. Um, you need to continue to put energy into a system in order to maintain it. So, um, yeah, so going to answer your question just a little more before we move on. Um, we may be getting a little bit more in our energy budget right now. You know, uh, but even that changes over time. I think we've talked about um, the, the, the record that we've been able to find in the ice and in the rocks and so on and so forth that, that uh, climates have changed over the years. <laughs> You know, so there are times when we did retain more of the sun's energy than, than others. That's certainly true. But we're way bigger picture than that in this slide. We, we're talking, you know, universal crap. Yeah. So, um, but good observation nonetheless. So the second law of thermodynamics is, is, is chaos. Things will tend towards, um, things will tend to fall apart. You have to keep energy into the system. Um, in order to maintain it. And the perfect example I, I give of this one, and I, for some reason I'm getting a little deja vu that I told you guys this already, but probably it's just because I've been given the conversation for three semesters for 25 years, um, is your bedroom or your house in general, your apartment, wherever you happen to live, your dorm room. If you don't put any energy into picking up your clothes, into throwing out your trash, into recycling your cans and bottles, the place is a mess, right? And one could actually argue against the laws of thermodynamics here momentarily. It seems like the longer you let it go, the more energy you have to put in to maintain that system. If you just, and I, I find myself arguing this at home all the time, if you just put in a little effort every day, you've heard this, right? Yeah. You wouldn't have such a big mess to clean up. Well, that's true. Energy budget-wise, probably the same. It just doesn't look pretty, and that's what we get all irritated about. But I constantly tell my family when they complain about having to spend, you know, X number of hours or whatever, minutes, hours, doesn't matter, doing some cleaning your room, okay, for Saturday morning. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to sit down and watch Bugs Bunny. Well, no. And if you had cleaned up your room every night after at the end of the day, threw your dirty laundry in your basket, picked up your trap, you wouldn't have to do this now. So. Anywho, second law of thermodynamics, okay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Energy is lost to the environment. That is true. That is not what I just said to you. Um, this is why you have to maintain the system by putting energy back into it. All right. No transaction is 100%. You have to keep putting energy into the system. Your clothes move towards disarray. Your everything. So, all right, thermodynamics, very important. And again, why, let's go back to completely and totally practical, you can't grow the same crop in the same field for five years in a row without putting more plant food in. You got to fertilize. Why? Because the plant's taking all those nutrients and energy out of the soil. So you got to put something in, whether it's your own compost that you make, some cow manure that you buy, or some nasty chemicals you buy at Walmart, whatever, you got to put more energy into that system in order to keep maintaining that garden. So it's not as far out stuff as you think, if you believe the nutrients are energy. 
Okay, so apparently I got slides for this, sorry. Uh, an organism may absorb energy from the environment, or it may give off energy to the environment, but the total environmental energy is constant. Well, that's true, and I didn't actually say that already, so that, that's neat. Big Bang. And it has been constant since the Big Bang, and that's what I was just saying. From the first moment, we've had the same amount of energy well, as we still have the Big now. Bang uh, it's generally accepted as the creation of the universe. Uh, okay. uh, supernova is when a star explodes. Oh. And a black hole is when a star implodes. Uh, you know about that, do you? Oh, what I told you? Yeah, no, they weren't trying to create a black hole. There were some people who were hoping they wouldn't. Um, but... Uh, that would have sucked, just flat out. Yeah, that would have been horrible. But uh, we like Switzerland for the most part. They make really good chocolate and uh, nice pocket knives. So, there you go. Anywho, so constant since the Big Bang. And, and again, that must have been why it was such a really big bang, if all that energy was contained in that teeny tiny little point. Uh, an organism cannot create the energy it requires to live. It must capture it from the environment. And this is to go just to straight biology for a minute. Um, you guys might hopefully remember some of this from, from uh, high school. What is the uh, energy? I don't think I list either of them on here. Good. Uh, the energy creator in a uh, cell. Who's in charge of making the energy in a cell? Yeah, mitochondria, awesome. How about in a plant cell? In a green plant, at any rate, it's chlorophyll. All right? So, going back to mitochondria for a moment, there are a decent number of biologists out there that argue that at some point, mitochondria were free living. All right? Why? Because they can make their own energy. They, they need a little something, don't get me wrong, but they are literally little power plants. And at some point, they were incorporated into cells. Now, that's implying thinking. There was no thinking. It was accident to go the evolutionary route there. But it happened, and it worked. So they argue that mitochondria were potentially, and this is a loose use of the word, organisms at some point because they could exist by themselves. Same thing with chlorophylls, okay? Same thing with chlorophyll. So, um, just a side shoot there. Uh, so plants use photosynthesis um, to grow and also to store. That's why eating plants is good for you because they store energy in themselves. Depending on the plant, depends on what you're getting. All right. And the same thing with the animals. Uh, animals eat uh, in order to maintain their life, uh, but often they, they store energy as well. Some of us more than others. Okay. Um, but uh, that's the difference whether you talk about a Twinkie being a battery or a carrot stick being a battery, right? Um, but, uh, but no, we're bigger than humans right now. We're talking about the animal kingdom as a whole. All right. The outside world. Uh, you'll hear me say many times uh, in this class that we are sort of out of this natural system as humans. Uh, I will make that argument to the, to the day I die. Um, you know, we just take, yes, animals make houses for themselves and so on and so forth, but we've, we've really taken that. And not just do we make houses, we make, you know, air conditioners and we make heaters, which allows us to be places that we probably shouldn't have been in the first place. We, we build roads to get to these places and, and all this stuff. And I don't know. I don't know that we've been part of nature for a while now. We certainly affect it still. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, but yeah. All right. So, anyhow, and then that energy, as we said, which was the whole point of that slide of the marsh a little while ago, if you remember that slide of the marsh, uh, is that energy is constantly transferred through said environment. Um, second law of thermodynamics uh, implies to us, uh, again, it says what, it's, uh, what I told you a little while ago, 
<coughs> that the uh, amount of usable energy uh, in the universe decreases over time. And we said sum is always lost in every transaction. And think about that in terms of money. You certainly don't want that happening to you. Let's say every time you change the dollar, you lost two cents. Well, on a dollar, you know, they're like, all right, fine, it's two pennies. We hardly even deal with pennies anymore. If it weren't for tax, right, we wouldn't even care about pennies. So, so you got to lose a couple bit here. But think about all the dollars over all of your lifetime. That's a lot of pennies. That adds up. So the same is true with energy. It might not be a lot that we lose in any given transaction, but over all those transactions for the four and a half billion years that the Earth has been here, let alone the 13 billion years that the universe has been here, could you that's, that's the longer than that. That would be hard if it were vice versa. For sure. I mean, Earth, yeah, oh, you said, I thought you said the universe. I'm sorry. Humans, yes. The Earth was here before humans, definitely. I thought you had were questioning whether the universe or the Earth was here first, and that's that one. That one has an easy answer. So uh, let's see here. So the amount of usable work decreases. Uh, energy hasn't gone away, but turned into heat, which isn't usable in a biological community. Again, we love our heat. Don't get me wrong. Um, but he is radiated by just about everything that is, well, by everything that is alive and even stuff that isn't. The sun's energy bakes into that blacktop, right, and radiates out, so on and so forth. So <clears throat> that just bounces global warming aside from our atmosphere that you mentioned earlier. That just all kind of fritters out into space, okay? And space is fairly vast. So what do we got here, this last one? You eat a carrot, you get energy from it to do work, yep. Uh, but some energy is lost as heat, and that is lost to the universe. So It's pretty big picture stuff when you try to apply it to its fullest extent. Keep it small. I mean, if you're digging it, then, you know, feel free to, to extrapolate out as much as you want. But if you're, if you're still, if you're kind of struggling to absorb this stuff, um, keep it small. Keep it small. Heat is disorganized. Um, it's not, again, arguably usable energy. I know that stands to contrast with how we feel about heat. So there's the word. I couldn't remember it a little while ago. I'm glad it's in here finally. Entropy is the word we've been talking about for that um, trend towards disorganization. That is how my teacher, whenever I first got turned on to thermodynamics, that's usually how it's described. Second law of thermodynamics equals entropy. Well, being the young college student that I was, chaos sounds way cooler, right? Um, and, and so that's the one I latched onto over the years. Um, and chaos is, you know, disorganization. So it is the same idea here, but entropy is the sciencey word for it. And entropy is increasing, all right? Um, and at some point, and you got to think about, again, there's a lot of critters out there. Uh, at some point, there will be no energy available to do work. Now, did we destroy all the energy or matter? No, we just told you you can't, right? What it does mean is that it will turn into heat. Everything will be the same temperature. That's a really weird way of thinking about it. But again, that's the sciencey end of it. Um, entropy wins. But that's a long time from now. Long, long time from now. Not even your grandkids, grandkids, grandkids kind of time. <coughs> we mentioned this. Oh, there it is. Car engines, 20 to 30%. So I was even high when I said 38. I don't even know where I got that number. But not good at all. We're not great either. We're 40% efficient. Twice as good as cars. Lost is heat. You could also argue, though, that if we weren't all giving off heat right now, you know, this room would be a little colder, and they'd have to use more energy than to heat this room, right? All right, we won't go that way. But...
we're constantly using energy, whether you're aware of it or not. Your metabolism, I mentioned that word a little while ago. All right, your metabolism is constantly going. Whether you have a high metabolism or a low metabolism or you don't know about your metabolism, trust me, it's always going. Um, the same thing with plants, okay? They continue to do their thing. Uh, yeah, plants don't photosynthesize when it's dark out, strict or light out. Yeah, they don't when it's dark out, but there's other stuff going on. You need the sunlight to have the chlorophyll do its thing, all right? Animals continue to eat some way more than others. Look at your grazers. They're always out there chewing grass. That must not be too horribly efficient, right? Works for them, but that constant need to feed. Us, on the other hand, we've managed to get it to a point where we could eat it just a couple times a day. Yes, some of us do constantly graze, but effectively, we don't need to eat anywhere near as much, so we must eat different kinds of food or get more energy out of our food or process that energy more effectively. A conversation for another class. So, as I said to you a long time ago, you must always put energy into the system in order to maintain said system. I gave you the example of your room, but your body is, is a great example as well. All right. Um, what time do we run till again? Eleven. No, not right now. It's twenty-one minutes to eleven. <laughs> eleven, though. Yeah, nine thirty-five to eleven. All right. So we can talk about photosynthesis. Sorry, guys. I didn't want to start it if we couldn't finish it. So. You've heard of photosynthesis. Um, you know it, you love it. Uh, we have a lot to thank plants for. Um, plants are responsible for first oxygenating the oceans. All right, you've heard of dissolved oxygen. If you haven't, you're gonna learn about it in the lab. Um, there was no free oxygen in the early atmosphere, all right? And the first plants were in the oceans. So the oceans were also free of oxygen, which meant critters couldn't live there because they breathe. They might use gills or whatever, but they need oxygen just like you guys do. So the first plants filled up the oceans with, with oxygen, and then once the oceans had as much dissolved oxygen as they could handle, it started to bubble out. And that slowly but surely put oxygen into our environment. That's the O2 that you and I enjoy breathing. That also allowed O3, which is ozone, we talked about ozone the other day, that allowed ozone to eventually develop. And ozone, as we said, filters out ultraviolet radiation, which allows us not to uh, get mutated quite so much. So we owe plants a lot. We owe photosynthesis for our existence, really. It's important. So, another word I couldn't uh, claim uh, out of my brain a little earlier is organelle. When I asked you about mitochondria, when I asked you about chloroplasts, the little pieces, parts, and cells, I was going to go and just remind you of the word organelle. So, I'm glad it's here because I forgot it earlier. So, what is actually happening in the chloroplast is that, um, <coughs> excuse me, sunlight and carbon dioxide are turned into sugar. Isn't that awesome? You just make sugar with sunlight and carbon dioxide. You never have to go to the grocery store again, right? Well, at least to buy sugar. But even more so, there's a byproduct that plants don't really even want, and that's that oxygen we were talking about. That's pretty dang cool. So it absorbs sunlight, converts it into a carbohydrate, going back to your biology or your nutrition classes if you ever had one of those. Glucose, C6H12O6. There's a formula for you. There's the formula. And don't worry, you, you, you've balanced formulas in your life, I'm sure. We're just going to say, trust us on this one, that you got the same amount of C's 
and O's and H's on the left as you got on the right. They just recombine into different things. Feel free to do the math, though. But what this says basically is that six carbon dioxide molecules plus 12 water molecules in the presence of sunlight, which is often shown as just sort of a wavy, you might see this in the book, sort of a wavy arrow coming down into the equation. But I didn't have a font for that, right? So I just had to write plus sunlight. And then the arrow, what's the arrow in the middle mean? It separates the two sides of the equation. Yields or makes. I wasn't talking to you, Siri. Goodness gracious. Means yields or makes. Okay, so the stuff on the left makes the stuff on the right. C6H12O6, what did we call that a minute ago? Glucose or sugar. Plus six waters, plus six oxygens. There's that oxygen. And the plant really could care less about oxygen. This is why you should put plants in your dorm room or your apartment or your bedroom or wherever you can. They suck up all the CO2, which we're constantly exhaling, right? And they turn it into oxygen. As long as they've got some sunlight, plants are good for your rooms. So it stores that sugar. It makes more than it can use. It uses the sugar to grow, but it also stores it in its stems and leaves and roots and whatever. Again, it depends on the plant. Sometimes we eat the roots, sometimes we eat the leaves, sometimes we eat the stems, sometimes you eat all of it. It's not concerned with what part we eat, it just does its thing. And it gives off the oxygen. This just recaps what we said. Uh, there is one new vocabulary here. Stomata. Stomata. These are important, actually, because these are little, little doors that open and close on plant leaves. You can't see them. They're super small. But that's where that gas exchange happens. Um, why they're tangentially important is when you talk about the water cycle. All right. And you talk about the importance of plants or forests, for example, in the water cycle. Um, they're, they're huge. And part of the problem is, is when they're doing that gas exchange, um, some water vapor goes in and out as well sometimes. So that's how they come into that conversation. But, um, yeah, stomata. stomata. Just to remind you of some words from biology a long, long time ago. Animals do their own version of photosynthesis. It's called cellular respiration. And arguably, <coughs> excuse me, it's a bit more confusing and complex, at least for me. Like I said, I'm no fan of botany, but photosynthesis was always very straightforward. Um, cellular respiration confused the heck out of me, I'll be honest. Most plants and animals um, do aerobic. You've heard of the word aerobic. We have aerobics as an exercise. All right. Cellular respiration, aerobic means air, arrow, air, okay? Uh, those are, are um, uh, things that must go on in the presence of oxygen. There is such a thing as anaerobic. You'll see a slide, I'm sure, for that in a moment. There's that prefix again. That means non-oxygen environment. So there are anaerobic processes as well, all right? But the majority of everybody does uh, aerobic. Oh, there it is right there. <laughs> anaerobic cellular respiration is possible too, so... There it is. It's not even horribly, you know, that different from the photosynthesis one. Um, maybe it was my, I had a bad teacher. I don't know. I just, I never, I never grasped cellular respiration though. C6H12O6, what was that? Glucose. That's the sugar. Wait a minute. Didn't we just get that sugar from plants? Yeah, that's the point. We're transferring energy. That's been the whole point of the last 64 minutes. I've been talking to you for 64 minutes. I apologize. I get it. It's boring. Same, same thing. So, C6H12O6 plus, what do we need? What did we get from the plants? Oxygen. Holy crap, this actually makes sense. Wait a minute. Plus water. And we turn that into carbon dioxide. What did I just tell you we exhale all the time? Carbon dioxide. 
Plus a whole lot of water. Well, we'll call that peeing. I don't know. Um, and energy. All right. So that's how you get that energy back out of the sugar that the plants make for us. Neato. Let's go back to some more words we already used. Potential energy, kinetic energy. Throw those into the mix where you see fit. And it shows how animals and plants are meant to work together. Yes, you could do the same thing if you ate an animal. Um, you would probably be digesting other things than the C6H12O6, but you get the idea. This is one small bit of that whole digestive thing. We're not really talking about digestion, okay? But this was made to show the connection between photosynthesis and cellular respiration and how they work together. Not that we're not talking about evolution or anything like that in this class, but hmm, seems to seems to work. Yeah, I just proved how we can coexist to one another by using each other. Well, not proved, I illustrated. We take the, the, the plants, turn the sunlight into energy, we eat the plants, and then we do what we do. Yeah. Or more importantly, the yummy things that we like to eat, eat the plants. We don't have to eat the plants ourselves. We can eat the sheeps and the cows and the... Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's always some energy loss. But you could also just eat the, eat the plants. So I'm going to save this slide for when the next time we start this conversation. Yes, sir. God willing, I'll be here if you guys are.